I'd like to welcome Lawton Robert Burns, and he's a professor of healthcare management here at Wharton. And he has a new book about China's healthcare system, and it's actually called China's Healthcare System and Reform. And his co-author is Gordon G. Liu, who's a professor of economics at Peking University. Um, and uh, thank you for joining us today. I understand you've written most of the book, but you have had, uh, in addition to your co-author, you've had some help from some other writers and authors. Um, tell us what the, the big arc of this book is about. Okay. Well, this book began as a global modular course back in 2012. So went over to Beijing, uh, met up with Gordon Liu, who I've known for a few years. He was actually a U.S. trained economist. We taught a global modular course on China's healthcare system and reform. Uh, and what we've done here is we've tried to embody what we taught in that course into a book, and it covers the entire healthcare industry in China, uh, which is very provider centric. I mean, China's healthcare system really revolves around its hospitals. And all the physicians in China, or most of the physicians in China, are employees of the hospital. But then we branch out from there after looking at hospitals and doctors to study the, the, the public and nascent private insurance industry, biotechnology, pharmaceuticals, medical devices. And then the real big thing you have to look at in China is public health, changing demographics, uh, the rise of chronic illness. Uh, the rise of a, a for-profit hospital industry in China to supplement the public sector, um, the growing long-term care industry. So we cover all of that um, as, as part of the book. So to uh, a casual observer, China was a, a pretty poor country by Western standards 20 or 25 years ago. Um, I'm imagining that their health care system at that time reflected that. Uh, obviously, they've come a long way in that time. Can you just talk about what's happened briefly over that period and then where they're trying to go? Because part of the book talks about uh, a number of reforms that they're trying to introduce now. But they've already come a long way, I, I gather. Right. Well, you know, China's economy took off after Deng Xiaoping uh, came into office in the late 70s. And they had the, uh, the economic liberalization starting in the late 70s, early 80s. China's health care system lagged behind all that. Uh, because the emphasis was put on economic development, not on health care. So it wasn't until you get to the late 90s, early 2000s, that the Chinese leaders decide that they ought to take some of that surplus they've uh, created and start pumping it back into the domestic consumption, domestic economy. And that's where you see a number of insurance reforms beginning. And the, the biggest one was in uh, 2009. Uh, with the health, China's version of Obamacare, mm -hmm. which was extending insurance coverage to over 95 percent of the population. Which is a lot of people. <laughs> it's a lot of people. Um, I can't imagine how you go about the, that kind of a distribution system, but maybe we can talk about that in a little bit. Uh, so given that, what, what were their biggest challenges? Well, the biggest challenges is uh, China is very much like us in some ways. Um, they have a hospital-centric health care system, which is very expensive. They also have sort of a, a mosaic of insurance policies, both public and private, mostly public. But, you know, we have Medicare and Medicaid, two different public policies. They have three different uh, public policies, one for the urban employed, one for the urban non-employed, and one for the rural. And so it's this mosaic, and it's not closely coordinated. And each one of those had their reforms in the late 90s, early 2000s. And by using these three pillars, China has extended health insurance coverage to most of the population. So they're like us in some ways, with there's no national health insurance. There's a, there's a smattering of different types of public insurance plans. But unlike us, their coverage is broad, covers most of the population, but it doesn't go very deep. So it only covers a handful of things, and the rest of Chinese health care is paid out of pocket. So would it be something like catastrophic coverage and only? Is it something like that? Well, up, in, up until the time these reforms were extended, uh, going into a hospital was catastrophic. Uh -huh. I mean, the cost of a hospitalization could be as much as half of your uh -huh. annual family, uh -huh. family income. And so these insurance extensions were designed to correct some of that to prevent medical bankruptcy uh -huh. from hurting the Chinese population. But the insurance coverage covers primarily these large, expensive inpatient hospitalizations, but nothing in terms of primary care or preventive care, things like that. So people have to, uh, it's one reason they may save a lot, because they know they've got 
they're responsible for a lot of their health care. Well, that expenses. well, they have to save for a lot of other things too, yeah. like education right. and retirement. The, the 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 one part of the book goes through the whole uh, social security system mm -hmm. and the pensions and things. Mm -hmm. All these areas are big problem mm -hmm. areas for China, and they're trying to figure out how to balance them all. Uh, speaking of balance, as as they go forward, you have a concept in the book called the Iron Triangle of Healthcare. Can you tell us what that is? Yes, I, I'm. It's it was not my idea. Uh, the person who taught the course that I'm teaching here at Wharton before me was Bill Kissick, who was a physician over in the medical school, and he actually wrote a book on it in the early '90s. And he coined the Iron Triangle, which is how I start every course here at Wharton. The Iron Triangle is basically every society has three public policy goals they're trying to achieve in healthcare: improve quality, increase access and reduce the rate of increase in health care costs. Mm -hmm. Bill Kissick called, the, called it the Iron Triangle because they were competing goals. Mm -hmm. And if you can imagine an equilateral triangle where each, each of those goals is an angle, mm -hmm. and they're all 60 degrees, if you mm -hmm. want to expand one angle, like increasing access, you're gonna, it's going to come at the expense of another angle, oh, such as cost containment. We've seen that here with Obamacare. Obamacare you know, is, it was slated to cost a trillion dollars to increase access to coverage for over 20 million people. So you can't have it all. Mm -hmm. You're going to have trade-offs. And so we apply that logic to the Chinese healthcare system. They face the exact same, same set of trade-offs. So they've increased access to health insurance for over 95 percent of the population. But at the same time, the rate of increase in national health spending in China is accelerating. And it used to be 3, 4, 5 percent of um, you know, GDP was spent on health care. It's now 7 percent and going higher. And so they're facing the exact same problems we are. How do you control rising health care costs and increase access to health insurance to the population? Uh, what's the role of private insurance then in China? Well, private insurance really hasn't taken off much there. Uh, we've had a number of U.S. and Western insurers try to go over there and set up shop, almost all unsuccessfully. Uh, one reason may be is the, the fact that you know, it's the private sector in China is distrusted. Public sector is trusted. The private sector is distrusted. Uh, I th also don't think there is a, um, a widely perceived need among the Chinese population to buy insurance coverage for something you haven't incurred yet. And so it's sort of like, you, you, would you rather save the money or buy an insurance mm -hmm. policy? And then if you distrust the fact that it's a private, mm -hmm. for-profit insurance company, there may be some reticence there. But th that's, a, that's a work in progress. Uh, you talk about some of some of the major challenges there, for example, uh, the demographic time bomb, which we can talk about. But there are other things, too, including uh, the pollution levels, which have a huge effect on, on the health of the population. Can you uh, tell us about that? Sure. I mean, I, the, the, uh, the changing demographics is a big worry for China. Mm -hmm. But I think even bigger worry for China is the environmental pollution. Mm -hmm. And the environmental pollution is in terms of the air, as we all know from Beijing, the water, the soil, sometimes the livestock and the poultry and things like that. And so there are all types of pollution over there which affect the health of the population. Just to give you a quick illustration, I was, I was teaching a master class to the uh, Wharton alumni back in 2014 over in Beijing. You know, number of Wharton faculty and the new dean, Dean Garrett, went over there. And so I was teaching a class in Beijing to the Wharton alumni, and I casually mentioned that uh, of course, you know that the average lifespan of a Beijing resident is five years less because of the pollution levels, and nobody in the audience knew that. So I thought I committed the world's biggest faux pas, mm -hmm. but it turns out, you know, it's documented evidence. But that's just how serious this problem is. And uh, so it's almost, a, I mean, it's almost like an arms race, is it? Because you're trying to introduce better health care, but at the same time, there's so many elements contributing to... to uh Bad health outcomes. Yeah, there, there, there are forces pushing for yeah. better health, mm -hmm. better health promotion, addressing the chronic illness mm -hmm. problem, getting people access to health insurance so they can get access to health care mm -hmm. services. But at the same time, you have these environmental forces, you have public policy forces pushing against mm -hmm. them. Just to give you another illustration, um, uh, smoking is a huge problem mm -hmm. among Chinese males. Mm -hmm. It's estimated that roughly half of all Chinese adult males smoke. Mm -hmm. Not so, not so much with the females, but with the males. Now, 
you'd wonder why doesn't China address that because we all know that smoking contributes to a lot of chronic illness. Mm -hmm. Well, it turns out tobacco is the seventh largest state-owned industry in mm -hmm. China, and China develops a lot of state revenues from mm -hmm. selling tobacco at low prices to its population. Mm -hmm. And so there's an illustration where you're trying to promote health by mm -hmm. labeling on cigarette packages, but at the same time, it's in the state interest mm -hmm. to manufacture and sell tobacco to its population. So the ultimate conflict of interest. Ultimate conflict of interest. Uh, there's a quote <clears throat> connected with all this that you mentioned before we started. Maybe you want to talk about that. Sure. I was. Uh, we were teaching this global modular course in Beijing. We have a speaker in uh, from Kleiner Perkins, who's Chinese by origin, um, but he comes into class and he, he says to my class, and so we put it in the book, it's questionable whether China will get sick and die before it grows rich and old. Okay, that kind of wraps it up there. Um, well, let's get back to the demographic time bomb because um, everyone's aware of China's aging population, or many people are, uh, particularly because of the one-child policy. Uh, so how does that affect the health care situation? Well, what you have there is you, you have, uh, it's sort of like a 421 demographic structure, four grandparents, two parents, one child. Mm -hmm. And so that one child is going to be really taxed in terms of taking care not only of his or her parents, but then four grandparents. Mm -hmm. And so what China really needs is a, a long-term care system, which it currently lacks, mm -hmm. as well as... Uh, you know, long, some form of long-term care insurance or social security payments or disability payments or, uh, you know, uh, well-funded pensions for the people who retire. China has issues within all of those areas. Are so these the, things under development? Uh, these things, well, they, they've enacted some reforms on the pension side, so pensions for uh, public employees, but they're underfunded uh, and they're not that big. And so healthcare, as healthcare costs in China rise, uh, then the cost of the care that those elderly are going to need is going to rise. And the question is whether those, that cost escalation in healthcare will outstrip, you know, savings and wage growth and things like that, all of which is taking place in the U.S. and it's also now taking place in China. So, I mean, it strikes me that pushing out healthcare uh, to 95 percent of the population is an enormous undertaking. It's, it, it's an, an incredible achievement in a way. What, how does uh, the health of Chinese stack up against other countries in terms of mortality rates, infant mortality, whatever the, the common uh, yardstick is? Yeah. Well, there, there are lots of uh, metrics there. We have this all in the book. The, the metrics have obviously improved. Mm -hmm. But I think the single biggest increase in the health of the Chinese took place under Mao mm -hmm. as a result of investments in public health. And, you know, research shows that over time, public health investments, you know, clean air, clean water, mm -hmm. you know, hygiene, sanitation, those have enormous payoffs in terms of mortality and morbidity. Mm -hmm. So China saw the biggest increases in those health outcomes under Mao and his emphasis on public health. Mm -hmm. We haven't seen the same rate of increase in those indicators in, uh, under subsequent leaders, but they've been occurring. And so you, you can compare China with other countries in Southeast Asia, which we have a whole chapter on. And it you can see the dramatic improvement in China as a result of this. So you've written a book about India's health care system and now China's health care system. And you've been studying the U.S. health care system for years and years. What do you see as the similarities and differences in these systems? Right. Well, we, we cover this also in the introductory chapter. The similarities outweigh the differences. What, what I tell my students here as well as in India and Beijing is that um, most of the healthcare systems operate under some of the same basic processes and principles. Obviously, there are institutional differences, historical differences, cultural distances. But at the end of the day, managing the cost of care managing the trade-offs in the Iron Triangle, trying to get people to improve their health behaviors. These are problems that are common to all of these countries. And so what you learn about managing the problems in this country is immediately transportable to these other countries in terms of here's some hypotheses about what might work and what might not work. So just to give a quick illustration, we've been trying to figure out how to control the rising cost of health care in the United States for since the early 1980s. Mm -hmm. 
outsider regulation. And so one of the first things we did in the early 80s, we passed uh, uh, what was called the prospective payment system using diagnosis-related groups. Turns out the United States has exported this concept of diagnosis-related groups to the rest of the world. Everybody uses this. China is now piloting experiments in several of its cities to try to control the rising rate of hospital costs in China using diagnosis-related groups. So some of these things are immediately transportable. Uh, um, what, uh, what haven't I asked you that's really uh, important to know about the, the yeah. Chinese healthcare system? And also, um, just wh where is it going? Where, do you, where will it be? How much will it advance and progress in, over right. the next three to five years? Well, let me take your first question. Uh, okay. What you haven't asked me is the problem China has is just the sheer size and complexity of the government and the country. So China operates, there's a national government, there are provincial governments, there are local governments, and the national government sets policy. But the provincial and local governments have to come up with the money. This was enacted 20, 30 years ago. And so you have this this, this uh, disjunction between who sets policy and who has to implement it with what resources. And that's always a tug of war as to whether or not the lower levels of government want to do or can afford to do what the upper levels of government mm -hmm. suggest. A second, that's a vertical dimension. Mm -hmm. The horizontal dimension is just the sheer number of ministries in the Chinese government that have something to do with health care. So you got this horizontal division of labor, you got this vertical division of labor, and getting any kind of concerted action where strategy actually gets implemented is totally problematic. So that's one of the biggest problems China has, just overcoming the size and complexity of their government. Um, the second question was? Well, just in general, what, what, where, where do you see all of this reform that they're undertaking right. going, and what will it look like? How much progress might we see in, say, three to five years, right. just to pick an arbitrary range? Right. Well, you know, as the economy slows down in China, you know, the, 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 the government has been using the high growth rate in China recently to take some of that surplus and plow it back into the domestic side to spur domestic consumption, to switch from an export economy to a, a domestic consumption economy. And so what they'd like the Chinese to be doing is spending more of the, the money that they've made on their own health care. The question is whether or not the Chinese want to spend it on health care versus mm -hmm. save it for retirement, for their children things like that. So that's uh, one issue. I, th I think the, the other thing China is going to have to worry about is, you know, they have all these initiatives to try to do things. So one of the initiatives in the, the more recent uh, five-year plans was to develop a biotechnology sector. Well, that, that's easier said than done. And so uh, one of, they've developed at least four different biotech clusters across China, mostly in the eastern coast of China, mm -hmm. and, and hopefully develop a life sciences sector developing novel therapeutic mm -hmm. drugs based on biotechnology. Mm -hmm. That is not easy to do, and as we've, we've studied elsewhere uh, in the healthcare program, what it takes to put together a biotechnology cluster really requires the confluence of uh, government help, private sector involvement, a lot of uh, equity and venture capital pull all of these things together, and it's an ecosystem of things, plus all these local universities with talent to spare. Uh, and China's ability to pull this off will be contingent on its ability to replicate some of the things we see in Cambridge, Massachusetts, or San Diego, California. Well, it sounds like they that there's a lot of potential for business opportunities, but whether or not the environment will allow these things to flourish uh, with all sorts of rules and regulation on investment and that sort of thing and repatriation, uh, repatriation of capital, that kind of thing. This is, the, the, I guess it remains to be seen how this is going to play out. Yeah, you know what I'd, I'd say to uh, companies who are thinking of investing in China? I think they have to know two things. They have to know the local landscape in China, and our book can help with that. There are other things they could read as well. But it, it gives you sort of the lay of the land mm -hmm. of all the different sectors in healthcare and how they're operating and the issues they face. The other thing is to understand why things work wherever in the world. And so if you understand why the biotech sector took off in the US, and it hasn't taken off as much in other countries. Or why the medical device sector is so prominent in the US, mm -hmm. but not so prominent in other countries. Mm -hmm. Then you can understand what are the conditions needed for this, mm -hmm. these sectors to really thrive in China. What are some of those things that make it work? Well, you know, uh, 
I, we, we've already talked a little bit about the biotech. Yes. You need a confluence of three or four major actors all mm -hmm. working in concert. And these are in local areas. You know, large parts of the U.S. would like to emulate Cambridge and San Diego. Sure. Even Philadelphia would like to be a biotech cluster. But it's not easy to do. So it's not even easy to do here, let alone in China. Mm -hmm. uh, secondly, with medical devices, the, the success of the medical device industry has really rested on the partnerships between the medical device companies and the physicians who implant or utilize those medical device products. Mm -hmm. And so you need a cadre of specialists mm -hmm. who are really good at you know, using these technologies, who demand these technologies, but who also help to invent or come up with the ideas for the new technologies. Mm -hmm. And so China doesn't have that cadre of specialists, implanting specialists mm -hmm. the way the U.S. does. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the things they're going to need. Well, thanks very much for coming in. And uh, maybe you'll be doing a follow-up on this soon and we can catch up with you. My pleasure. Thank you so much.